And welcome back to Innovation Land. So we are talking about stimulus mining methodology today and we've been off on a bit of a whirlwind tour among the different classes um, that I have with the third years at Niagara College in innovation practice. They're taking a course in process engineering with me as well as a course in innovation practice. And so sometimes it feels like the two lines are blurring. We've, we've explored uh, different concepts of theory of constraints with Eliyahu Goldratt. We've done some work with W. Edwards Deming and the Deming cycle and continuous improvement. And we've spent some time as well with Doug Hall's theories in innovation practice. Doug Hall borrows quite extensively from W. Edwards Deming approaches to um, continuous improvement and change management. And so I don't know what class this belongs in anymore, but rest assured the students are in both classes at the same time and innovation always happens to permeate into all the different activities that we're doing. So at the end of this video today, you'll be able to discuss Doug Hall's concept of stimulus mining for ideation and new product development. You'll be able to reflect on how new ideas are generated from connecting old ideas to meet new opportunities and identify some uh, clear strategies for stimulus mining, specifically with food product development in mind. So Doug Hall, as you mentioned before, he is the CEO and owner of Eureka Ranch. He is a Canadian, however, he has worked internationally all over the place. He is typically based at a PEI, but he also works out of the University of Maine. And he's also a food product developer, which is kind of cool because uh, he's taken his concepts in innovation practice and thought about whiskey in particular. He has, he has a, a line of whiskey where he's focused on accelerating the aging process. And while that product may not meet the quote unquote standards of identity for a true whiskey product, it has all of the sensory and uh, flavor attributes of classic whiskey, but prepared in days rather than years. So one of Doug Hall's great quotes here is that ideas are feats of association. You have these two pieces of stimulus, you put them together and you create a new idea. And Doug Hall's writings and um, uh, consultative work focus a lot on how do you generate new ideas. And so that's what we're talking about today. This is a meme that's been going around in COVID times, but I, I really liked some of the premise behind it. I'm, I'm not a, oops, for, pardon me. Um, the whole premise of coming up with ideas and knowledge and insight really comes down to the foundations that you need data to start off with. And you need information. You need to expose yourself to a lot of different ideas and concepts and just go out in the world and be curious about all the things that are out there to be able to start to make those connections. Knowledge is where we're starting to make those connections from point to point to point and turning it into useful insights that allow us to be productive or create new things. Wisdom is where we're able to start to see all these disparate points coming together into unified concepts. We'll leave the conspiracy theory a piece out of this, but honestly, the more the, the key principle that I wanted to raise from this meme, and I laugh that I'm using a meme in my slideshow, but the more we expose ourselves to data and information, the more we go out on these fact-finding explorations. And when I say fact-finding, I'm not meaning that we have to go out and study just textbooks. There's lots of ways to learn about the world that we're working in and ways to learn about the food uh, product development space that aren't necessarily just studying textbooks. There's so much richness that's out there right in front of you at any point in time. So how are you being stimulated about ways to get ideas about food product development. One of, one of my favorite ways, uh, quite often when I am eating my breakfast or just eating any food at my house, and my, my teenage kid knows this, I will start just prattling on about everything about that product. I will look at the packaging material. I'll look at the ingredient declaration and ask myself, why is each one of these ingredients in there? I will look at the 
physical attributes of that product, thinking was this uh, sheeted, was this extruded, was it um, created on a drum dryer and then ground up, was it freeze dried? I look at all of the different physical attributes of that product and I ask myself a million questions. I look at different manufacturing marks on packaging material. I look at date stamps. All of these are just stimuli that are sitting right on my kitchen counter. I love going grocery shopping. There's so much richness in grocery stores and even grocery store to grocery store, there's differences. Going out and eating, studying the menus, thinking about the different food trends. And if, if right now I realize that COVID is putting a hamper on people going out, but many restaurants have their menus and suddenly you could be not just looking at the menus of places nearby, you could be looking at the menus of restaurants in Japan or in, in South Africa or you name a place, you could find menus for the restaurants that are in that space and get a better sense of what is driving consumer choices. Reading cookbooks, there's still a lot of value behind that. And as much as the classic physical books are so wonderful to have in your hand and to see the visual uh, storytelling, I also highly recommend following many of the food bloggers and even many of the food YouTubers or um, social media stars. Why? Because they're, they're really honing in on some interesting trends that are absolutely at the minute. Do read your trade magazines. Do read outside of your field too. I can't stress this enough that as much as you want to be a food expert, you need to get insights into business and politics, into law and into engineering. And the more you can expose yourself to other um, aspects of science and technology and business and politics, the more it's going to help you succeed. Do get out to trade shows and conferences. Do read your scientific literature. I realize that many of you have paywalls that limit your ability to read much of the scientific literature, but at least read the abstracts to get some ideas. And if something's really intriguing you, reach out to the scientist that wrote that paper, because quite often, if you ask some really great questions, they may be willing to send you a PDF copy of their paper. And I, I can't stress this enough. Most people who are experts and industry insiders are very generous with their time and they want to see young people succeed. Don't just go reach out to them on LinkedIn and say, hey, what's up? Reach out to them with some really good structured questions. I love using LinkedIn. Um, and honestly, lots of people reach out to me, but when people reach out to me and say, hey, do you have a job? I'll usually give them the time of day and say no. Um, but if people reach out and have really good questions, like what are some ways to learn about this technique or who are some of the people that I should be speaking with to learn this topic, I'm more than willing to take the time and answer that question properly. So if you're reaching out, do ask good questions and make sure that you're structuring it in a really respectful but curious way so that people know that you're not just wasting time. So going back to Doug Hall, he has some very clear strategies for mining. And I want to, uh, I've just taken my own generalized approach in the previous slide, but let's take a look at Doug Hall's stimulus mining strategies. He talks about market mining, future mining, patent mining, wisdom mining, and insight mining specifically. So what is market mining? This is where you are looking at a wide variety of different marketplaces to gain um, insights. So could you borrow brilliance? That's his term from other places and markets. So it could be taking an idea from another country or another region. It could be from uh, taking uh, an idea from, let's say, um, manufacturing technology or IT and aligning it with food manufacturing. You do want to mine your markets to know what your competition is doing so that you can always stay ahead of them. Do take the time to mine your own internal information. You do want to be out there reviewing your own operations objectively and step outside of your ego and uh, so oftentimes companies go and pat themselves on the back saying we're the best, we're fantastic and they need to step outside of that ego to identify opportunities for improvement. Do mine your supply chain. Your suppliers often have really key insights about what's coming in terms of new ingredients or new, new product solutions. They may also know about upcoming problems. Uh, for example, if there's been droughts or environmental challenges 
that may hamper the supply chain on different uh, ingredients or different trade disputes. Your supply chain is equally a partner in your success. Do take lots of time to reflect on your own strategy, but reflect on your competition strategy and tactics to make sure that you are responding in a way that's going to keep your own organization ahead of the game. Next, future mining. So you do want to keep an eye on the future. Um, what are these upcoming trends and shifts? You do want to connect with your users to hear about their pain points, and there's a whole other mining strategy that talks about connecting with your users. But something that's really critical is to see these shifts in demographics, shifts in laws and regulations and behaviors. So for example, um, wouldn't it be nice to be a toilet paper supplier right as COVID hit? We know that honestly their sales went very, very quickly through the roof. If we can see some of these shifts coming ahead of time, many, many people who I knew in the sector said, we see stuff going down in China and they said they saw this in January, long before the shutdowns that started to occur in North America in March and April. Many of the companies that I, I work with knew that with these shifts in the shutdown of the economy, there would be shifts in demographics, such as um, beverage companies who knew that as soon as restaurants shut down, people would be drinking at home and there would therefore be a supply shortage of glass bottles and aluminum cans. And so the companies that anticipated this put in bulk orders of aluminum in advance of the of the shortage. Do take the time to read a, read what is coming politically and um, from a global perspective. Let's say, for example, you are buying in um, raw vegetables from Florida and there's hurricanes coming. You may be wanting to, looking at, uh, looking at diversifying your supply chain or um, identifying if you can purchase in product in advance of hurricanes or have some sort of mitigation strategy. Honestly, take the time and look at what's going around you in the world to know the impact on your business operations. Oh, actually, here's another one. And you can use um, artificial intelligence to identify trends. Let's just take a moment here. I'm actually going to jump right out to a web page here. Oh, where did I put it? Google Trends. You type Google Trends in. This is fun. It Honestly, Google and their artificial intelligence allows you to go in and look at their statistics within all of the different searches that have been out there. I was doing a search earlier just to have some fun with this. I wanted to see, let's say I, I am in the breakfast cereal uh, category in Canada. This could be really insightful to see what's what's trending right now. If, if I haven't been out there watching the news and the magazines, I might go into Google Trends and see what have people been searching. And so if I type in cereal, I change the locale to Canada, I type in cereal, what have people been searching for when it comes to cereal? There's a blip right here, and that blip, in terms of interest in breakfast cereals, right at the beginning of January. And I think I know why. Take a look at the queries that are out here. Tim Hortons, Timbit cereal, Timbit cereal, Elf on the Shelf cereal, Eggo cereal, Tim Hortons cereal. If you recall, there was that Tim Hortons. There was Tim Hortons cereal that came out and it was hilarious. These cereal that looked like Timbits, tasted like Timbits and they were extremely trendy and they're uh, a bit of one of those uh, really short-term trends that are going to flash in the pan and have a big, huge impact really, really fast. Taking the time and reading up about some of the trends that are impacting the industry, just, just having that uh, artificial intelligence insight, that's something that's completely available to you. If you are, let's say, looking at takeout food or you're looking at fast food or you're looking at frozen dinners, you could be looking to see what are the trends that people are looking up relative to that category. Something else that's worth talking about, we will have a whole slide deck on intellectual property and patents for food companies, but in some segments, 
Patents are extremely lucrative. In the food manufacturing sector, trade secrets are more so than patents. Most of the time, companies are managing their intellectual property by just having all sorts of non-disclosure agreements and making all of their employees sign non-disclosure. The Coca-Cola secret or the the um, secret uh, combination of herbs and spices in KFC are great examples of trade secrets where they don't go out and patent it. They have kept it a secret within their employee group. That said, patents are eminently available and you can start to search for them online. And honestly, um, many times larger companies will have patent groups to see if they can manage intellectual property related to their inventions and innovations. Um, something that's worth noting, usually those are lawyers and lawyers are very expensive. You can do a lot of the initial searching and review yourself to quickly gauge is this somewhere that, or is this a topic or uh, an innovation that has had all sorts of different aligned patents put in place and therefore would have some sort of intellectual property p potential? Or are we seeing nothing? Or are those patents in related fields so old that it's no longer, um, it's no longer maintained? Take some time. Google, again, has a really big uh, global patent database and don't just look in the country that you are working in look at all the countries around the world because again if you have intellectual property managed in one country it is potentially um, able to be contested within a different country so do take a look at global patents not just Canada or not just the United States wisdom mining this is where you're looking at the the literature and the scientific wisdom that's out there. So again, uh, Google has their Google Scholar database. I am not affiliated with Google in any way, but uh, Google does have a lot of really great research tools for this. You can go into Google Scholar and look up all of the different scientific journals that have been out there. You can leverage some of the databases that are out there. PubMed is not bad. Um, Agricola has some uh, database information as well, more specific to food. Honestly, uh, another really key feature is to start to recognize the names of experts that are in the field that you're interested in and be bold enough to reach out to them. Again, just like what I said with LinkedIn, you might be able to find some of these experts on uh, different university or college websites and reach out to them directly by email. Don't just reach out to them and say, hey, I have a question. Ask really well-structured questions. Think through the detail of exactly what you're after because, again, most experts in the field are busy people. They are really curious and really engaged, which means that if you are showing them that same reciprocal engagement, they're more likely to respond with kindness and to respond with an interesting answer. So be aware of when doing wisdom mining, if you're doing it by just going out and asking, then you might, you, you've got to do it well. Other times you might have to pay people, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Insight mining. This is where you're going out and listening to the voice of customer. So you do want to go out and take a look at some of the social media that's out there, whether those are Yelp reviews or um, other online review sites relative to your product or your category of product. What are people saying about these products? You want to hear what customers are saying, but you might also want to go out and identify people who are not customers. That may be more done through informal networks, um, but sometimes it's important to find out why, why people are not buying a product. And that not buying often provides a lot of insight about opportunities for improvement or opportunities for innovation. You do also want to find out about people who are dedicated to your competitors. Why are they dedicated to the competitors? And what would be the sorts of um, advantages or benefits promise or benefits statements that you could align with your product that would sway a customer from one of your competitors potentially over to your product? What's really cool about doing insight mining is that putting out survey tools and polls is so much easier than ever Historically, many different market research firms would take months and months to design questionnaires and 
then have to do all sorts of analysis on that. There are so many tools. Um, we will have a whole course on uh, consumer studies and sensory analysis in the winter semester, but designing these questionnaires, oftentimes it takes much more, um, it's, it's far more advantageous, pardon me, to go ahead and do a really, really fast and furious questionnaire and get some data so that you can quickly iterate within your concept rather than trying to plan an all-out exhaustive questionnaire and take so much time that you have fallen behind on the progress of the rest of your, uh, your project. Those of you who've been uh, following along with this series, you know that we've been doing TOC and CPM mapping. Don't let your insight mining become the hindrance on your progress. This insight mining oftentimes can become something that prevents people from moving because they say, well, I need more insight. I need more insight. I can't make a decision until I have more insight versus can I quickly get some baseline insight so that I can move on my idea. Use all sorts of different um, technologies available to you. Uh, survey tools are very, very accessible and they can be emailed out or put out through social media campaigns and they can be done really effectively and there's some really nice statistical analysis platforms that are often built into these tools so that you can quickly gain insight. Again, those of you who are following along with this course, I can't say enough about going out to many of the different events that are in our ecosystem. For those of you who are product developers, going out to shows like Seattle or the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology's tabletop shows, these are so um, ridiculously important when it comes to insight mining because you can tap into almost all of those different insight mining techniques in one, one event. You have experts in the room, you've got all sorts of stimulus around you, there's information sharing that's going on, people are out there um, really wanting to engage and uh, give insight onto why their products are really um, worthwhile. I can't say enough to young product developers to get out to events like CL, like CIFST's tabletop, go out to these networking and showcase type events because they're absolutely likely the most rich stimulus mining opportunity that's available to you. The biggest thing of all is just getting out and connecting with all the people that are around you. Have really rich conversations. Talk about the different ideas that you have with people that you trust and just start building out these ideas into networks and platforms. You can always have fun, you can always discover something new when you have a good conversation with someone that you trust. So again, go out and try it. Go and figure out what stimulus is useful for you and your projects and have some fun with it. I always enjoy talking with you and we'll talk to you again soon. Take care.